can find this out in the bookstore as well as many, many other titles. So with that, I'll invite up Brad. Caitlin, great job. Worship team, awesome job back there. They did a great job, and they always do, but it was really, really awesome. Hey, one more announcement that's kind of connected uh, to one that Caitlin just gave. We have a really cool thing that came up out of nowhere. I mean, it, just in the last uh, several days, not even a week, we had the really the coolest thing. So uh, my pastor, Adam McCain, uh, uh, he's the uh, director of Christ for the Nations, and um, I was meeting with him to talk to him about something unrelated to what we wound up talking about, because we've talked about a bunch of different things, and one of the things that I, I mentioned to him was, hey, <clears throat> uh, you know, th this whole thing with IHOP, it's really gotten really tough, and uh, they're actually going to shut down the school, and, and he just was grieved, and he said, he said, Brad, what do we got to do to get all their credits to transfer to Christ for the Nations. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll transfer all of them. Like, we'll, we will make this the easiest thing ever for them if they want to continue their education. And then they can still be connected to a prayer room with you guys. He said, I'll, I'll make it so that all their practicum hours, all their ministry credits, all, their, all the time that isn't them in class but still required as a CFNI student, they've got to do that at the prayer room. And he said, would that be helpful? And I was like, yeah, I think that would be really helpful. So I reached out to the president of uh, International House Prayer University, and I said, hey, uh, the, the director of Christ for the Nations is saying this. Would this be helpful? And he said, oh, my gosh, that would be such a gift. He said, I, we got to move fast on this. Uh, let's talk here and there. So Adam and I wind up in a Zoom call with uh, their kind of registrar folks uh, in just, you know, that same day or the next day and uh, work in a detail. Adam and I are actually flying out to Kansas City Monday uh, because uh, I'm going to make a plug at their chapel. They call it Foundations. Monday night, their, their time uh, that they're together every week and talk a little bit more about the ministry trip. And then at the tail end of that, their uh, administrative team is going to announce that he, uh, that Adam and I are in town to talk about a partnership between TPR and CFNI with IHOPU. And they, CFNI has been very generous in their transfer credits. They are going to take everything imaginable. And what this is going to wind up equaling is um, if a student from IHOPU, that remember that school, it's going to cease to exist in like 15 days or 20 days or something. If a student from there wants to transfer to CFNI, they'll transfer all their credits. They'll still get to be connected to a prayer room here with us. But CFNI has some significant agreements with accredited universities that will transfer the credits. So, a, so an IHOPU student could actually transfer to CFNI and a, a year later transfer to Grand Canyon University or Dallas Baptist University or many others, and their transfers, their credits would all transfer over. So, I mean, it's like a really good opportunity uh, for these CFN, or for these IHOPU students, and yet another way that we might wind up with some additional people plugged in around here. And that wasn't even why we're doing this preview weekend uh, or this preview trip. So it's like this is kind of getting a little out of hand. I mean, there's, there's some crazy things happening. And so, um, so the, the, the leadership of IHOPU is really excited about this. Uh, we were on a Zoom call uh, with one of the kind of beloved professors there, Chuck Mateer. And, uh, and at the end of the call, he said, this is the best opportunity these students can have. I'm going to tell them all of them need to do this. That's what he said. And I was like, Dang, that's a high endorsement right there. And so uh, anyway, there's some cool things happening. It's also crazy busy right now because of all this is happening fast and blah, blah, blah. So next Monday, Tuesday, I'm sure we'll change rapid fire to praying for Adam and I as we go to Kansas City. Man, you guys just pray. And I'll just say it this way. Look, I'll, I'll give you the, the way that I'm praying in my heart, and I, and I feel good about it. So if you can get on board with it, great. If you can't, then don't pray it. Pray something else. But here's the prayer I'm praying. Lord, bring a ton of students on this trip and let them have a great time, point one. Point two, every one of them that you know this would be a good place for, speak to them about moving here. And that's the prayer I'm praying. Every one of them that you know this would be a good place for them, speak to them about moving here. And so, uh, so that's going to be what we're doing, and then we'll see what's going to happen. I'm just saying this. We haven't yet made the announcement at their chapel and we've got 37 or 38 students signed up. What happens when we make that announcement at chapel? 
And all of them go, wait a minute, that's where all of you are going next week? So I'm just concerned IHOP U is not going to have anybody in their classes for a couple days. So we'll take them off. They'll come. So, Okay. Well, Lord, we thank you so much for all the grace that you've poured out on this house. We thank you for the grace that you've given us to study the end times because it's kind of a lot. And we pray that your spirit would move tonight and give us even greater clarity as we look at uh, these chapters on the end times in Jesus' name. All right, we're in a long study. If you guys didn't catch that, we're going through these 150 chapters, and most nights we only cover one chapter. In fact, for a couple of sessions, we had to do two sessions on one chapter. Uh, so it's, we're not moving fast, is my point. And we're doing a study <clears throat> looking at what does the Word of God have to say about the second coming of Christ, about the time period right before He comes and the time period right after He comes. That's kind of been our major focus in this series, and there's a lot of information on it. And so uh, one of the things that's uh, a little bit unusual is we are looking at a lot of passages that you've probably read before but weren't necessarily thinking it was end times. But when we look at the themes that are included in that, in that uh, chapter, we go, oh my gosh, these are absolutely end time themes. And maybe not every phrase, but certainly the theme of the chapter, you go, wow, this is actually, this is about the second coming of Christ. And so uh, the, the last couple of sessions that we did, we did on Deuteronomy chapter 28. And if you're not real familiar with that passage, which it's understandable that you wouldn't be, that passage, Deuteronomy 28, is what's commonly referred to as the blessings and the curses. And it's the covenant that God made with Israel. And he more or less said, listen, if you walk with me, I'm going to bless you so much you can't imagine it. He says, if you turn away from me, I will send you curses. I will send you great difficulties to get you back. It's actually not mostly to punish. It's mostly to cause them to wake up and go, our God is doing something in our midst in order to draw our hearts back to himself. That's the major focus. And so we looked at that. Well, Tonight, we're doing the next couple of chapters. It's Deuteronomy 29 and 30, and, uh, and so we're going to be looking at that. So we're going to kind of touch on, you know, what, what is the difference between these, um, these uh, two chapters and the one that we were just looking at? We're going to kind of cover some of the overlap, some of the differences. Um, so first thought process here is uh, Deuteronomy 28 <clears throat> is all about how they're going to treat the covenant that God's making with them. That way God was giving them Deuteronomy 28 as a covenant, and it's all about how they're going to treat that covenant. And what he, in Deuteronomy 28, God really makes it clear what he wants. He really wants for Israel to walk with him. He's like, I want to bless you guys so much, but it is contingent. I'm not going to just bless you because you wake up in the morning. Like, I need you guys to walk with me, and if you will, I will bless you so, so much. And so God is really stating his intentions. His, his desire to bless uh, the people of Israel. However, the requirement that they walk with him. Well, Deuteronomy 29 and 30, which it's the very next chapters, right? It's not like we changed gears. It's more information on the sub same subject. Deuteronomy 29 and 30, the tone changes a little bit. And now God says some stuff that's really hard to hear. He says more or less... I know you're not going to listen to me. And because I know that, I'm not going to tell you what I would do if you disobey me. I am promising you some things about your future because I know you're going to disobey me. However, he doesn't end there. He says, after it's all said and done, you're not only going to obey me, I will help you obey me. And then you will walk with me forever. And so it's, the tone changes. I mean, it's, it's not just if you do these things and I'll do this. He says when you do these things because I know you're going to. And he talks to Israel knowing with foreknowledge they're going to actually wind up in both extreme camps. The fully with God and the fully against God. Which is just what he got done teaching and are giving them in Deuteronomy 28. So it's kind of intense, okay? Well, one more, uh, you know, I'll give you kind of a, uh, a simple contrast here between Deuteronomy 28 which is what we've been studying for the past couple of sessions. And now what we're going to cover tonight in 29 and 30 is that the promise of what would happen to them if they obey or disobey was chapter 28. 
But now 29 and 30 is the prophetic foreknowledge that they are, in fact, going to walk in both uh, paths uh, at some point. Last point that I'll bring up here in our little intro, just as a kind of a, I don't know, I find it interesting. Deuteronomy 28, because it was so long and it covered so much information, it took us two sessions because it was so much. I mean, we, we just could not have covered it all in one session. It would have taken us two hours. What's interesting now is we're going to get two chapters done in one night because the amount of information in chapter 29 and 30 is a lot more concise, both the length of the chapters and also the amount of information that's covered. And so while 28 took us two sessions, 29 and 30 are only going to take us one, okay? So let's, uh, let's get into it here. God's reminder about the covenant. That's how we're starting chapter 29, okay? Uh, so we're going to read chapter 29 here uh, on uh, page 2. And this is God reviewing the covenant. Remember, he just gave them the covenant in the previous chapter. It was a long chapter. Now he's going to review it a little with them. <clears throat> Yet the Lord says, During the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals of your feet. You ate no bread and drank no wine or other fermented drink. I did this so that you might know that I am the Lord your God. Carefully follow the terms of this covenant so that you may prosper in everything you do. You are standing here in order to enter into a covenant with the Lord your God, a covenant the Lord is making with you this day and sealing with an oath to confirm uh, you this day as his people, that he may be your God as he promised you and, and has swore to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am making this covenant with its oath, not only with you who are standing here with us today in the presence of the Lord your God, but also with those who are not here today. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to worship, to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such, uh, such bitter poison. When such a person hears the words of this oath and they invoke a blessing on themselves thinking, I'll be safe even though I persist in my going uh, my own way, they will bring disaster on the watered land as well as the dry. The Lord will never be willing to forgive them. His wrath and zeal will burn against them. So intense. All right, so let's start off here. What are we looking at first? Well, first he reminds them, of the way that he just treated them so kindly as they wandered around for 40 years and their clothes didn't wear out. Guys, that is one of the most powerful miracles in the Bible because it happened every day for 40 years. Can you imagine passing down clothes that have been worn every day or every other day or every three days to your kids? And I mean, I'm not talking about that one jacket that was kind of trendy back, you know, 30 years ago, and it kind of went out of style, and now it's coming back. I am talking about the same clothes. It's like, how, is, how are they not, like, dilapidated, and how is there not just, like, one thread barely wrapping around a person? The Lord says, I caused your clothes not to wear out. That is a profound miracle, and it was part of God's way of saying, I'm the one that told you to walk around the desert, in the, you know, to not have a place, and I will sustain you through supernatural means. And God is reminding them of this. Well, interesting, it's, of course, God is saying, I did that during those desert wanderings, but I just want to read you a passage from Revelation. God's going to do the same exact thing with the people of Israel for three and a half years during the Great Tribulation. He is going to take them out into the desert again in order to protect them from the Antichrist aggression. Look at this. Read uh, Revelation 20, I'm sorry, Revelation 12, 5 through 6. She gave birth to a son. It's talking about the nation of Israel. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, Jesus. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne, talking about his ascension. The woman, Israel, fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. 
1260 days is one of the many ways that are, descri- that are used to describe the Great Tribulation period, three and a half years. Three and a half years is 1260 days. It's also called 42 months. It's also called a time, times, and half a time. Uh, there's a number of phrases that are used to define the same three and a half year period, the Great Tribulation. Israel is going to be led out into the wilderness again to be taken care of by God in the same way that she was, or in a similar way, but not for 40 years, this time it's three and a half, uh, in the Great Tribulation period. And so it's interesting that even back in Deuteronomy 29, as God is restating the covenant and talking about what's going to happen to them in the future, as well as where they've been in the past, that we've got this little wink back at the desert wanderings where God sustained them and he was with them. Pillar of cloud, pillar of fire by night, you know, that kind of thing, in order to be with them and be their, their God and show them that he's in charge and he protected them and he provided for them. He's going to do it again in the end time drama. All right. Well, why did God do that? Said that, you know, God did that for 40 years. He led them through the desert and their clothes didn't wear out. Why? I did this so that you might know that I am the Lord your God. It's the exact reason he's going to do it again in the desert wanderings in the time period of the Great Tribulation and the book of Revelation. It's that he is doing it to make the emphatic statement, I am your God. I am unique. I am different than all the other gods of the earth. I am your God. And I'm going to do this desert wandering thing so you'll all look back in your Hebrew Torah and see, I did it then. I'm doing it again. I am your God. I am the God of the Jews. And also you missed my son, who was my solution. I am the God of Jesus. I am the God of the Jews. And he's going to do the whole thing. It's going to be a wild display of God's power uh, in the end time drama. The covenant made with a future generation. This is a big deal. We don't operate this way. Whenever we make a promise or if we were ever to make a covenant, we don't make it with other generations. We make it with the person standing in front of us. I mean, even we go till death do us part in our biggest covenant that we make, you know, in marriage. Because we're not making promises for generations but God does. God makes promises to generations, to peoples and to their children and to their lineage and to generation after generation. That's a big deal. So when God says something to a person, that's cool. When God says something to generations, that is infinitely bigger. That is a really big deal. And this covenant that he's making, he's making with generations. Okay? So I gave you the verses there, but it's, I mean, we just read it. Skipping down to letter D, One of the long-standing negative traits of mankind is to live in contradiction to God's ways and yet deceive ourselves into thinking that God's okay with it. We live in a generation right now that is increasingly calling evil things good and increasingly calling good things evil and bondage. And they're totally wrong. And it's it's been a human trait from the beginning to know what God wants or to hear what God wants and then convince ourselves that it's okay to live a different way. This is kind of a a very normal human thing, unfortunately. Well, God addresses this, and he says, it's not okay. He says, listen, with you that I'm in covenant with, it's double not okay, and we're going to deal with it. He says, make sure, make sure that there's none among you that treat this covenant with contempt. And then he even says specifically, it gets really intense, he says, He says, someone who says, or when such a person hears the words of this oath and they invoke a blessing on themselves thinking, I'll be safe, even though I persist in going my own way. God says, no, you won't be safe. In fact, you're bringing disaster on the watered land as well as the dry land. He says, you're bringing curses down when you do that. And God says, I won't put up with that. I'm not going to be okay with that. This is one of the reasons that in the final generation, We really want to pray for Jews because there's a lot of different ways. It's not one or two ways. It's like like eight or nine ways (laughs) that Jews can go in this final generation. There's going to be some that are a part of that wilderness thing. There's going to be some that will be killed. There's going to be some that will turn to Jesus. There's going to be some that will turn to Jesus and be martyred. There's going to be, I mean, there's all these different categories of Jews in the end times. I mean, it's not one or two groups. We want to be praying for Jews because we want this category to be the absolute smallest imaginable. The ones that look at the covenant that was given to them and they say, I'm going to live my own way and God will bless me anyway because God has severe punishment in place for that group. So we want to pray, oh God, spirit of wisdom and revelation on the Jewish people. 
Let them see the truth. Let no one, oh God, please, as close to no one as possible, fall into this camp, okay? All right, well, when Israel disobeys, remember I told you that God in his foreknowledge, he knew it wasn't just, I need to tell you guys this in case you mess up. He knew there was going to be some significant persistence in turning away from him. And so this is now what is written in Deuteronomy 29, uh, 20 through 29. So it's just, it's the very next verses here, okay? And it's, it's more or less him saying the consequences are great if you turn away from me and if you don't walk with me. Here it is, Deuteronomy 29, 20. All the curses in this book will fall on them. Who's the them? The them is the group that we just uh, talked about that's uh, turning away from the Lord and thinking that they're secure. All the curses written in this book will fall on them, and the Lord will blot out their names from under heaven. The Lord will single them out from all the tribes of Israel for disaster. According to all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law, your children who follow you in later generations... This is talking specifically about the children that follow that generation that does that. I mean, it's true of any generation, but he's specifically saying the children that follow the generation that lives that way, your children that follow in a later generation, and foreigners who come from distant lands will see the calamities that have fallen on the land and the diseases with which the Lord has afflicted it. The whole land will be a burning waste of salt and sulfur. Nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing on it. It will be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Adma and Zeboim, where, uh, which the Lord overthrew in fierce anger. All the nations will ask. All the nations will ask. Why has the Lord done this to this land why this fierce burning anger? And the answer will be, it is because this people abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. They went off and worshiped other gods and bowed down to them. Gods they did not know, gods he had not given them. Therefore the Lord's anger burned against this land so that he, might, so that he brought on it all the curses written in this book. In furious anger and in great wrath, the Lord uprooted them from their land and thrust them into another land as it is now. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all his words of this law. All right, so let's look at this a little bit. First, he says, I will blot out those that go into a self-denial mentality. That they're like, yeah, we're, we're the children of God, And because we're the children of God, God is going to bless us, and we can do what we want. And so we're going to walk our own way. God says, I'll blot their names out from under heaven. That is really intense. He does not talk that way very often to really anybody. And it's a covenantal promise as part of Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30. The full measure of his plagues will be poured out on that group of people. Again, that's why we want to be interceding for Jews. Because there really are going to be people in that category. It's just horrifying. Future generations will remark about Israel's destruction. This is talking about the millennium and beyond. It says all the nations. There has never been a time that all the nations on earth said anything about Israel. Ever. Maybe a bunch of nations, but not all of them. It says all the nations will see what has happened and go, why so mean? Like, why so angry, God? What? And God goes, I told them and they didn't listen. I told them I was going to do this and they didn't listen. And so he gets really intense about it and says, future generations will remark about Israel's destruction. Specifically, to start with, it'll be the future generations of the children. It says, your children will follow you in later generations. It's it's prophesying into the future. It says, a time is coming when the children will look back and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe that our forefathers, that our parents, that some of us turned this way. Oh, my goodness. And it's going to be a byword. It's going to be part of the, the legacy of, of Israel forever is, uh, is children of Israel looking back on the past of Israel and going, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that we ever got that far out of sorts with God. It'll be part of the language. It'll be part of the, the, uh, the, the testimony. 
Okay, and all the nations will take place. I, I just told you that. All the nations will ask, why has the Lord done this to this land? Why his fierce burning anger? All the nations will ask it. The only context for all the nations to ask that question is after the Great Tribulation. When the Great Tribulation has, war has just destroyed the land, the cities have fallen, the land will be scorched earth. We read in a minute, it's like sulfur, it's like, it's reminding him of what it was like for Sodom and Gomorrah, but he's describing the whole land of Israel. That's never happened before. That has never happened, where the entire land of Israel was like scorched earth. It's like, well, what's that going to, ha- how's that going to happen? World War III, the Great Tribulation, all the judgments of God, the Antichrist kingdom being set up in Jerusalem, and all, you know, all manner of sorts of issues and, and all the ways that, uh, that the Lord is going to bring judgments against uh, the Antichrist and, and bring judgments against Israel. And all the nations are going to go, oh my gosh, that was intense. What was this about? Can you imagine all the Gentile nations that have not been tracking with the story? And now Jesus shows up and like, okay, can you just imagine the question in the hearts of so many? Like, okay, you're Jewish. Why did you do so much bad stuff to the Jewish place where all the Jews live? He says, because I am the Lord their God. I told them I was going to do this in Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30. I told them that this would happen if they didn't walk with me. So intense. Next page, top of page five. Because they broke the covenant, and the nations will be warned and will understand. The answer will be it's because this people abandoned the covenant. This is God speaking to all those nations that are asking, what just happened? What was all this about? Like, so intense. Like, we've never seen anything like this in human history, and yet you're the God of the Jews. It seems like you would have made it, like, easier for them. And he says, it is because they forsake the covenant of their ancestors, and I mean, So they're supposed to be warned. I mean, this is really intense. And then God says this interesting phrase. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the ways, uh, all the words of this law. This is God saying, in, in essence, there have been many secrets shown to people. Some, you know, are known to all. Some are known only to his people. He says, some are still reserved that I've not, yet, uh, I've not yet shown some of the secrets of my heart. And that's an invitation into intimacy, into friendship. He says, I am the God who has secrets, and I am willing to share them with you. I'm sharing some secrets with you now. You may not particularly like it. I can just imagine the Jews that day, the nation of Israel, hearing this and going, we really like the first part. But could you just have stopped there with the blessings? This is really intense. And God goes, no, these are the secrets of my heart. And actually, I'll invite you in to greater level of intimacy, friendship, and understanding. If you will walk with me, there is great uh, exposure or uh, uh, access to my heart. And I will share with you the secrets of my heart. In fact, the secrets of God belong to the children of Israel so that the children of Israel might walk with God. That's what it's for. This is a really intense reality. I mean, it's this is like a really, like you could pray this in a devotional meeting. Like you could pull something out of Deuteronomy 29. You probably wouldn't want to pray too much else out of Deuteronomy 29 for a devotional meeting. But it's interesting that God sneaks this one in there. Because he's right in the middle of like really intense stuff. And then he makes this pivot statement. But it, this is the pivot. This is how he ends the it's going to go bad for you when you walk away from me. But it's how he transitions into the positive. It's interesting because Deuteronomy 28, it was the positive stuff first and then the negative. Deuteronomy 29, it's the negative stuff first and then the positive. Okay? So now let's look at the positive because praise the Lord, there's positive. Okay? Same God. But now we're in chapter 30. So we just finished chapter 29. Now we're diving into uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Okay? Okay? And this is uh, verses 1 through 10, okay? So now I'm going to read it. They will come back. Israel will return to the Lord. God doesn't just say, like in Deuteronomy 28, if you walk with me, I'll do this. He says, oh, you will. You will come back. In fact, I'm going to get you. He says, I will absolutely have you as my people. This will not end in your rebellion. I refuse that. You will be my people. I will get you. 
which is a really encouraging way to end the conversation, actually. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, all of them. When all of them come on you. This is an interesting timing thing. This says when they all come on you. That hasn't happened before. When they all come on you and you take them to heart, which means they have to have happened for the, for, for the people of Israel to look at it and go, oh, wow, dang, he's our God. We need to pay attention. When you take them to heart, whenever, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you even if you've been banished to the most distant land under the heavens. From there, the Lord your God will gather you, and, will, and you will uh, take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands I am giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands and in all the fruit of your womb the young of your livestock and the crops of your land. The Lord will again delight in you. And make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your ancestors. If you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in the book of the law, and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. It's really cool. I don't know if you caught it. The language isn't only if you do this. He says, when you do this, you will. He says, the Lord will go and gather you from all the places and will make you more prosperous than you've ever been. The fullness of both the blessings and the curses, that is, a, is really an intense reality. Israel has experienced most of the curses, not all. And Israel has experienced most of the blessings, at least to a certain degree, but not to fullness. But this is what God says. He says, when all these blessings and curses I've set before you come on you, a time period where all of them come on you. So not like, hey, there's been a little bit here in this generation, and then a generation later there's a little bit more. He says in the time period when you get to experience both fullnesses, full bad and full good, he says in that time period, I am going to come and I'm going to restore you. He says you will realize when you take them to heart, not if, when you take them to heart, there's coming a time when Israel is going to look at all that God is doing because these covenantal promises were given so that Israel would, in fact, turn to God. He says, a time is coming, and when you turn to me, rather, when you realize, <coughs> you will turn to me. You also will be dispersed across the nations. Whenever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, we talked a little bit about that in our last couple of sessions, that despite all of the efforts of Israel in this hour, to get Jews from across the earth, to make Aliyah, to come back, to be a part of Israel again, to, to get citizenship in Israel, to, to make their new home. So they used to live in Texas, and then they moved to Israel, or, or wherever they're coming from. Uh, it, despite all the efforts to do that, because of the aggression of the Antichrist, all of the Jewish people will be dispersed across the nations again. And so God says, I'm going to have to come get you. And that is a significant, we're not, we're not going to go into it tonight, but there are sessions where we'll cover this. It is a significant, fun, beautiful reality when Jesus says, I'm king of the earth, top priority, go get my family. And he sends Gentiles out all across the earth to go get Jews and to bring them home. They're like, what is going on here? Well, we're going to do that whole going back to the Israel thing. And we're here to help you. In fact, we've already bought the plane ticket. And like, how it's going to be really cool. It's a really beautiful picture. Anyway, um, they will return to the Lord. It's not a question. 
And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I've commanded you, when you return to me, they will return. The nation of Israel, though it's going to be really hard between now and when this happens, and there will be highlight moments, people getting saved and you know little revivals and things that are going to happen in the, in the final like great harvest. There's going to be beautiful moments, but overall the story is going to be a challenging one for Israel. But it ends with this glorious victory. They will return to God, and God will restore him. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you. It's going to be awesome. And God will regather them. He's going to gather them from all the nations where he scatters them. Notice he takes responsibility for the scattering. It's really interesting because when you look at the details of how they get scattered, it's the Antichrist. And God's like, yeah, I'm going to even use him. Because I'm so serious about this covenant, I will use whatever means I have to to get you back and for you to realize I am God and I am serious about you walking with me and about you receiving my purposes and my promises for your life. I will even use the Antichrist. I will scatter you through the Antichrist. And then I will come and gather you. It's really, really intense. And God will make them most prosperous. I love that line, most prosperous. Or or it says, I will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. So think about this. When that happens, which this happens in the millennium, okay, this happens when Jesus comes back. The nation of Israel will be more prosperous than at any other time in the nation's history. And there have been some significant moments of prosperity. I mean, this is one of those promises that the Jews really like about the future rule of the Messiah, is we're going to be the most prosperous we've ever been. And it's going to happen under Jesus' leadership. The best times are under Jesus' lead in the millennium. All right, well, look at this. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and all your soul and live. Now, check this. It's really good. A time is coming where God, in the context of all this stuff we just got done talking about, a time is coming when God is going to come and circumcise the hearts of an entire generation of Jews, and not just their hearts, he says, now we're going to do it as a lasting thing to your descendants. He says, this is going to be different. It's no longer going to be a little here, a little there. It's no longer going to be a generation turns to me, and then a generation or two later they turn away. He says, I... I'm going to circumcise your hearts. I'm tired of letting you be in charge. I'm going to do it. He says, I will enter in. And he's, he's assess, uh, essentially saying this. I will mark you with the greatest commandment. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You will love the Lord. With the Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4 passage, the Shema, O hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Worship the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is, this is God saying, oh, we're going to get it my way. We're going to really have it. He says, after I brought you through all the trouble and all the hardship, your reward is I myself will circumcise your hearts in order to empower you to live wholehearted Christianity. I will help you. I will empower you to live out the fullness of what it means to be Jewish. I will help you walk in the fullness. You will live out the greatest commandment. You will live out the Shema. You will walk in all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And your descendants will, and their descendants will, and their descendants will. I'm changing the rules of the game. Right after I take you through the greatest time of pain and testing and turmoil that you've ever faced, I'm now going to, I will involve myself, and I will circumcise your hearts. And you will be my people, and I will be your God. And then God says, and I'll send the curses that have been upon you, I'll send them on your enemies. A big piece of that starts during uh, the Great Tribulation, but it actually carries over even into the millennium. We find that there are curses that will come on nations that don't operate in certain ways of obedience. Uh, One of them is the nations won't get rain, we're told in Zechariah, uh, I think it's chapter 14. You were told, or maybe 12. We're told that the nations won't get rain if they don't come and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. If they don't send delegation from their nation every year, it says, well, then that year your nation won't get any water. Tough times. He's like, like, listen, I am going to make sure that everybody knows I am God, I am the God of the Jews, and I'm the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And Israel will walk with God. I just love that. You will again obey the Lord and follow his commands. You will. 
That's such good news. I mean, Israel's history has been so challenged. It's been so up and down, and there's more down to come. But then there's the greatest up, and that's the final story. Up and up for eternity. That they will walk with God, and they, they will uh, uh, seek Him. And then God will make them very prosperous. There'll be victory and fullness and blessing. Worship leader, you can come on up. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands. So when God circumcises the hearts, when Jesus is leading in Jerusalem, when the nation of Israel is now under the full uh, embrace of the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, when they're doing that, God says, now I will bless you so much, I will make you the most prosperous that you've ever been. I will bless everything your hands touch, and it will be obvious to everyone that I am the God of the Hebrews. It will be obvious to you, and it will be obvious to everyone else. And so this is now fullness. This is the millennium. This is how Jesus is going to rule and reign. This is really good news. So just again, a quick recap. Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30. He starts off with the promises of blessing. He says, if you don't do that, I promise you curses. Then he starts off in chapter 30, uh, 29, and he says, by the way, I know you're not going to obey me. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you I'm going to send on you every single curse I just told you. But then he says, after I've done all that, I'm going to send on you every single blessing. And I myself am going to get involved because you are my people and I will get you. I will redeem you. You will be saved. You will walk with me. The end of the story is God and the people of God, the Jewish people, walking with him forever. That is the story. But to get to all that, we need the end time climax, the end time drama. Because these things, while there have been pieces of all of this that have happened through history, it's just been pieces. The storyline is for the end times. So, Father, we ask you for clarity. Would you help us? It's a lot of hard stuff we're looking at. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us clarity, that you would give us grace and strength. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us as a, as a group of forerunners that's trying to know the word. We're trying to understand the generation we live in and looking at passages we've maybe never looked at before, not in depth. Would you give us grace to study and to understand? Minds that are quick to understand. Would your Holy Spirit help quicken things in us that we might know what you're doing and might be completely on board with it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're turning this back into our prayer room. So please hang around and have conversations.